The first African-American president of the United States. Our first family will be African-American. Every reality we grew up with in terms of ethnicity will be different. The politics of racial grievance die tonight. And I take it, therefore, around the world, criticism of the United States for being a racist nation will now stop. Then it becomes, are we post-racial? I mean, that's where the question of inspiration and promise of America plays in. Oh, post-racial. That was a complete and total load of bullshit. Yo, Barack Obama changed my life, son. Do we participate in a politics of cynicism, or do we participate in a politics of hope? The hope of a skinny kid with a funny name who believes that America has a place for him, too. That legitimately broke me to tears. It was the first time I saw the nation recognize that I exist. There were pictures of him with his white mom. I have the same picture of me with my mom. It was the first time someone with my story was the story. My parents shared not only an improbable love, they shared an abiding faith in the possibilities of this nation. I felt a deep relating to him and, and a sense that we have as an identity, as a people, as a community, as a generation, we are showing the best of what we have and what we can do. I was not surprised that Senator Barack Obama won the election. What was fascinating to watch was the ways that Americans wrote on to the Obama candidacy and then onto the Obama presidency so much of our own racial understandings and racial anxieties. Senator Obama, how do you address those who say you're not authentically black enough? When I'm catching a cab in Manhattan uh, in the past, uh, I think uh, I, I've given my credentials. My initial reaction to Barack Obama was suspicion because he had a white mom. Because I always assumed if there were to ever be a black president, he would not be politically black, that you could not be politically black and uh, become president of this country. Because the whole model of a African-American political candidate was somebody who came up through the civil rights ranks and had a, like a preacher background. And that just wasn't who he was. More or less his family's ascendancy to the White House meant more to me than Obama himself. I mean, Michelle is probably why the black community accepted him anyway. What kind of a role do you think race has played in this race? You know, I think race is always uh, still in this country. It's always on the table. To see that he was married to a brown-skinned black woman from the south side of Chicago who clearly talks and acts like a black woman, I think was very important to me. Like, he's not just a black dude on paper. You know, he had black experiences. So that's what he meant to me personally. By the time he wins the, the primaries, it's like he's way too black. The moment that that happened was with Reverend Wright. Not God bless America, God damn America. Senator Obama said that Reverend Wright was like an old uncle who sometimes says things I don't agree with. I mean, it is really a very biracial moment where he's like trying to explain American race relations and win a primary. I'm the son of a black man from Kenya and a white woman from Kansas. And you feel him walking this rope, just, ah. Uh. This union may never be perfect, but generation after generation has shown that it can always be perfected. His ability to morph and communicate with different people was reflective of something that I, as a multiracial person, had too. When he's canvassing and seeing all these, like, white, kitschy, figurines and thinking, I've seen this in my grandmother's home. I can kind of create a conversation. And so in that way, I relate to him because I can connect with white people sometimes differently and organically. And I think that that is a part of my biracial experience. Why don't you say I'm biracial? Well, you know, when he was first elected, one of my friends who is biracial sent me a text message and she said, what do you feel about them saying that he's a black president? I mean, isn't he really biracial? Like, we should really be talking about that more. And I didn't respond to her because I get it. Like, he's black. The way I feel like I'm black, it is who we are and it is also who the world perceives who we are. 
the pilot of Blackish. There is a moment where the father is telling the mother. All this coming from a mixed woman who technically isn't even really black. If I'm not really black, then could somebody please tell my hair and my ass? In the same episode, he's talking to his kids about how they need to understand Barack Obama, the first black president. That's me and Obama, and that's also how America, and particularly black America, deals with mixed identity still. If the world saw me as African American, uh, then that wasn't something that I needed to run away from. That's something that I could go ahead and embrace. When President Obama filled out his form in the 2010 census and identified as African American, I think it helped people to understand that there's not just one way to be in terms of race. All these years in this country, no one cared to discern which black people were all black and which black people were half black. But when President Obama said that he was black, suddenly a lot of white people got very upset about that and wanted to ask why wasn't he claiming his white side? Why wasn't he claiming his white mother? Why wasn't he calling himself biracial? Like, word? Like, that one drop rule was a thing that existed that y'all came up with. There may be lots of reasons that President Obama had access to white privilege, sure. But that's different than like, being acceptable because he had white blood. Because, you know, black folks in America have white blood. Which, by the way, means white people in America have black blood. Part of the absurdity of race is that we have a discussion about mixed African Americans when the African American community itself is a mixed community. DNA tests show that the average black person is actually a quarter white. What that says is that we have been mixed since we were forcibly brought to this country. What bothers me is this sense that this is something new. I see these stories after story that are saying how we have rising numbers of biracial people and how this is going to solve the race problem because suddenly, you know, black people are mixed. That somehow you take the biracial people and they'll be the literal example of the coming together of the races. If that's the case, race problems would have ended about 250 years ago. Transcending race is a phrase that comes up a lot because people want to be over this whole racism thing, but they don't actually want to do the work. People used to say that about Barack Obama all the time. He transcends race. Well, he obviously didn't because the guy who said he wasn't born here is now president. I want him to show his birth certificate. A lot of people do not think it was an authentic certificate. How can you a say that if the... So it goes from insufficiently black to way too black to like a Muslim non-citizen outsider. Americans have told themselves the story that the civil rights movement happened and we all lived happily ever after. And then we elected a black president and then we lived happily ever after again. And I think people are really reluctant to take a hard look at that story and see that it's not true. The Obama era was a bit of a blip and we perhaps didn't understand how much work we still have to do. My teenager was born while I was living in Chicago. And so she was a preschooler when um, Barack Obama was running for the U.S. Senate. So the very first word that she read was the word Obama. I love that. But what that also means is, um, so she was, she was with her dad, my ex-husband, um, in Chicago on the night the Zimmerman verdict came down. And I got called in to MSNBC to do live coverage. It took 46 days for George Zimmerman to be charged with second degree murder for killing the unarmed teen. So remember, the kids who lived through Obama as our president also lived through Trayvon, Michael Brown, Philando Castillo, right? In the past decade alone, these men and hundreds of others have lost their lives to police. She is looking at black empowerment and black death right next to each other in her country. The beginning of a much larger conversation about race and policing. I was on maternity leave during the high publicity of Black Lives Matter. And I was sitting in a room holding my baby, watching it on TV. Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! And it really kind of made me realize that I didn't want her to have an unaided guide into race. And that was an experience that I had as a child. I am a direct beneficiary of the civil rights movement. I was able to do things that my father and his generation never could have dreamed. And I hope that my daughter will do much more than me. But that's just looking at it on an individual level. As a community, 
Black Americans have a very tough time ahead and we will continue to have a very tough time and that is the world that my daughter will come of age in. You could say that America is, has always been a kind of driven by competing nationalisms, right? There's a nationalism that says America is, is a white Christian country and everything that is good about America comes from that. And there's a nationalism that says we are all immigrants. America's greatness comes from all the different kinds of people who have come here to make a better life. You know, you look at Barack Obama and you look at Donald Trump and I think what you see is those two nationalisms that have been wrestling since America's inception are still wrestling. As a public defender, I walk in every day and see the same things happen to black people every day. And there are small incremental changes, but largely what's happening to black and brown people in America stays really consistent. That's why I feel so strongly about educating my children on blackness. It's about loving blackness. It's also about keeping them safe. I mean, clearly we're not post-racial in America, so there'll be a time when they are forced to confront issues of race. You know, you give them all the tools to understand who they are, and then you set them free in the world. My twins were born uh, in two separate flavors. How they're going to negotiate it, the rules are changing, right? So as the rules change, the best thing I think I can do for them is give them an understanding of where the rules come from and what's behind them so that they're prepared to adjust with the nuances of tomorrow. Being a parent has made me think a lot more about how I'm going to approach introducing them to the concepts of race and how I'm going to introduce them to America. On my Twitter handle, I say I write about race from 1619, the year the first Africans were brought in this country to be enslaved. 1604 is when the first English land in Jamestown. 15 years after, white people arrive on these shores, we have decided that we are going to enslave Africans. That is 140 years before we become a country ourselves. So that is all to say that racism, racial caste, and white supremacy are embedded in the DNA of our country. And to somehow believe that we will ever purge ourselves of this, I think um, it's just not realistic. When we were little, my father, he always signed our birthday card. The struggle continues, daddy. It is the greatest gift my father ever gave me because the struggle does continue. And your job is not to necessarily finish it. It is to acknowledge that it came before you, that it will likely go on after you, and to keep naming it what it really is. Like the problem is not black folks. And the problem is not like relationships between people. Uh, the problem is white supremacy, patriarchy, and the way that it tries to destroy and dehumanize. And so that, those are the power structures that have to be brought down.